wanted to uh, have an episode where um, an expert comes on and, you know, you talk about the history of Afghanistan and what led to this point, um, but not necessarily from the U.S. perspective that yeah. we're accustomed to, right? Yeah. So I don't know, like, one of these things that is often, um, you know, like Afghanistan is often referred to as the graveyard of empires, right? Mm -hmm. First the British, <laughs> yeah. the so it's become a meme at this point. First the British, the Soviet, uh, the Soviets, and then the Americans, right? And then next is supposedly China. So this term was coined by 19th century British imperialists, and I was hoping you could maybe start with uh, like maybe British involvement in Af Afghanistan and sort of give us a historical yeah. overview from that. But first, before we dive into that, that history. Um, what is it about Afghanistan in the first place or its geostrategic location that makes it a site of such vital importance? You know, why were all these so-called empires interested in Afghanistan in the first place? Yeah. That's, um, so, you know, Carl Zah, who I think has been on your mm -hmm. show, he's been, I've yeah, been on his show. He's another part of our little universe right yeah 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 uh, but he talks he talks he's talked about the british Empire. i think it was on my show that he was like you know the british uh were like Gollum, and like india was like the ring for them it was like they're precious like they just everything they did was for india um in the in the 19th century and um for them uh afghanistan was like a buffer zone okay. so for them it was like okay we have india but there's a Persian empire here. Um, there are local powers. Um, there's uh, there's like a Sikh empire that they hadn't, they only managed to get rid of in 1849. There were Marathas that, that they were fighting. So they were fighting a series of wars to finally get control. And then they only really um, consolidated their control over India a hundred years after they started. So they started in well, I mean, they got there 1700 or something, but they started really, um, they took over revenue control in 1757 after this battle at Plassey. Um, and then from 1757 to 1857, it was just a series of wars and takeovers. And in that period, they were really obsessed with what could threaten our long-term control of this Indian empire that we have that, that is basically driving in the industrial revolution. It's like bringing unbelievable wealth to Britain and uh, you know, to a degree that they can then start to recycle it to a degree that they um, then take the opium of course, and in 1839 go and impose that um, opium on China um, so they start a whole other kind of engine where they're taking tea from China and selling opium there. And um, that's another kind of one of their engines of accumulation. And then they use that power to get into China to break down China's industrial, I mean, not yeah, industrial uh, system, but also their agricultural system and create like a commodified global grain economy. So they're just, they're just doing... Um, you know, world domination with India as their the basis of their the linchpin of their whole project. And the, the soldiers that are fighting these wars for them in Asia are Indian soldiers. So it's manpower, it's wealth, um, it's, you know, the development of these engines, the dismantling of the local uh, networks of trade and commerce and industry. And um, Afghanistan uh, is not you know, is independent. It's an independent power. It's been independent since 1747. So like, you know, and, and before that, it was part of the Persian Empire. And the Persian Empire was in so quote unquote decline for a long time. But, um, you know, there was there's always <laughs> we can judge that now or we you can judge it at the end of the 19th century. But in the middle of the 19th century, you, who knows, right? What What could happen? The possibility that some of these uh, powers, Asian powers could combine into an alliance was was terror, was an obsession of the British. So they wanted to create this buffer zone 
and you know they talk a lot about how they were worried that russia was going to come and take india from them i don't buy it and other other afghan you know other i say other afghan but like afghan historians like for hussein was has been very dismissive of that idea um at, you know arguing that it was really about local uh, muslim powers and, and empires and the the fear of of those powers combining to uh be able to throw the british out so uh for the british it was that and again like if you think about a map like even going back before then afghanistan is this you know it's it's right in the middle right it's the mm -hmm. real bridge between uh south asia east asia central asia and then you know points west right persia uh which is this huge uh another huge important um part of the of the continent um and the order you can see now like the order that they're trying to build through the shanghai cooperation organization you know where china russia iran now has joined uh pakistan the central asian republics they're all they're trying to they're trying to do something now that there's no big um imperial foothold anywhere there now mm -hmm. like again with the with afghanistan becoming independent um yeah so so you can see like uh, in all of these cases going back at least to that time uh the 19th century afghanistan's been important and it goes back before that because it's on the silk road um and it's just, you know, and, and if you go back even before that, there's this author named Frederick Starr who wrote a book called Lost Enlightenment about like Central Asian science and culture and technology in, in like medieval times in like 800 to 1100 and like the circumference of the earth, you know, the distance to the moon, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, all these things were first figured out in Central Asia, like what's now Afghanistan or Uzbekistan people like Al Khwarezmi, um, Al Biruni. Uh, so it's just it's it's always been like super important. I mean, I don't. I also don't believe that any place is unimportant. Um, so I don't really like, uh, you know, just because they have these geopolitical fantasies, it doesn't mean that there are actually places that are unimportant or important. But like, if if you want to talk about perception or the reasoning that they have, it's definitely important <laughs> mm -hmm. um so now why what what well, i've lost my i've gone on five different tangents how, how, so do, how can we bring it back let's go back to <laughs> british involvement in afghanistan yeah, right. um okay. you know they uh you know they were like wanting to get involved to protect their like indian colony yeah. right yeah. Um, so, so can you talk a little bit more about that involvement, like this, the wars that yeah. they fought? So what they're doing in this period in the, you know, like I said, from 1757 on up until 1857, what they're doing is they're basically like making alliances with one or two kingdoms to take down others. So they had their sights on the Sikh Empire um, and then the Afghan, the Afghan Empire, which was called the Durrani Empire at the time, but like the Afghans, um, they were interested in that. And so it was like who who they were going to take down first. And uh, ultimately, they took down Afghanistan first. And then they took uh, the Sikhs down right after. But like there was this, um, the the plan in Afghanistan was, and, and it was a pattern that they repeated over and over, was to install somebody on the throne, um, get the get the rights to collect revenue, uh, from from them, like be they become the tax collect, the British become the tax collector for this Asian monarch, and then um, they run the army and they run the bureaucracy, and and then they pay a pension to the to the monarch. So that was what they wanted to do. They found this Shah Shuja, um, who had been an exile. He, you know, he was a, he had a ca cause. He was a candidate for the throne, and he was in exile. And I think he was in exile in the Sikh. Uh, kingdom with uh, with Ranjit Singh and he was not very happy <laughs> there mm -hmm. so um, the British kind of offered to put him on the throne um, and the person they were deposing was a was Dost Muhammad um, Khan so Dost Muhammad um, uh, was he had a, quite a degree of support in Afghanistan from the nobles uh, so when the British invaded um, 
there was a lot of resistance in 1839. So this is 1839. This is the same year as the Opium War mm, um, mm-hmm, with China. Mm-hmm. So it's like the, you know, the the imperial like ambition. I don't know what the word is. The gall, like the like the arrogance. I don't know, but like the the just the 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 fact that they were like invading Afghanistan and um, fighting this Opium War with China at the at the same time is. It's really something. But in any case, they they go, um, they invade and they commit, you know, they commit a whole host of atrocities um, invading Afghanistan. They occupy Kabul. And this is where, like, I have this theory that, you know, some of the some of the like the practice that's called Purda in in um, northwest in like Pakistan, north northwestern India and like Afghanistan, where like women are like covered like they're they're supposed to be covered at all times and like you know kept in the home and like physically covered i think it goes i have this theory uh just from what i've read like i don't think it's been systematically put out there but like that it goes back to this period because the sexual exploitation of afghan women at this time by the british was like really open and really explicit Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. like they were they were you know if, if a british soldier liked someone's you know some woman uh including like if the woman was married to one of their afghan allies they would just go and like kidnap her Mm -hmm. um and there are all various incidents of like including like noble women or like famous women from you know big families and the some like british guy would be like yeah i'm taking her Mm -hmm. and he'd just take her wherever to back to india or whatever it was so I, i think um that was like, I don't know. I I could imagine a, a big cultural reaction to that. Mm-hmm. Like there's some, there's some. You need some explanation for the extreme um, of of what is happening, and it made a lot of sense to me because there was, there was just like there were characters like Mohan Lal, this um, Indian agent of of the British, and there was another from who was from Kashmir actually, and there was this guy Alexander Burns. Um, if you look up Alexander Burns. Uh, you know, the guy was running like a, like a party house, you know, mm-hmm. in the middle of Kabul. And, um, you know, they killed him <laughs> eventually. <laughs> I don't mean to laugh, you know, but, uh, you, you know, he, it was, it, the story of his death is also like, it's like a tragic comic kind of story. Cause all these people that were, that had been kind of working with him, like showed the, showed them the way to to his place and where everything was hidden and all that stuff. So um, he was not as popular as he thought he was. And the Brit- that was this, the whole, the whole British situation. So they, um, they got themselves in there by kind of making these alliances with these uh, different Afghan nobles, but then they alienated them. Because they just, you know, they, oh, this was also a period of the 18th and 19th century where they're getting more and more racially arrogant and more and more into like ra- different forms of like scientific racism and their Victorian morality. And like they, it's weird reading William Dalrymple too, because like Dalrymple has this, it's clear that he has this kind of nostalgia for like the time when. British men could just go and have these incredible <laughs> adventures, you know, in the Orient. And then, and then, you know, ah, you know, the Victorian religion and then their stupid wives started coming and like just ruined it for everybody. Mm-hmm. Right? Like it's, there's, you get that vibe. I don't know if you've read it. But I haven't. You get that haven't. Vibe from <laughs> but in any case, um, 1842, they are like the, the Afghans, like all their allies, kind of join up all the british allies rise up with the british enemies and just kind of unite to kick the british out Mm -hmm. um and the british have this retreat you know where they're they're being shot at and sniped at and like uh it's interesting because the the afghan guns were actually better than the british guns in Mm -hmm. 1839 um this was like just around when the tech the british technology was overtaking um, or European technology was overtaking Asia. Like in the Opium War, the the Chinese had these guns where like two men would fire it at the same time. It was called a gingal. But then um, 
it wasn't as good as you know just wasn't as good as the uh what the british had at that by that point mm-hmm. which was a lot of like asian technology that they had you know developed and like you know repurposed but um okay so 1842 they throw them out and and there's a there's a route and they lose a lot the british lose a lot of men most of them indian soldiers but some of them british and they so they make a big deal out of this and they make a big deal out of it for partly for like war propaganda reasons so like because um they lost uh that battle they that's where the graveyard of empires thing comes from and it's for two reasons. One is like, well, you know, we lost, so there must be something really special and bad about Afghans that that was why, like, we lost because we're obviously invincible. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, so it, and, and remember, too, like the psychology of of British Empire was like they were very um, worried that the mystique that they had was a big part of them, their ability to rule India, right? Mm-hmm. They never had very many numbers. They they were always dependent on Indians fighting alongside them or like What do you mean them. by mystique? Meaning like the idea that one British soldier is worth a hundred Asian soldiers. Got it, so got like it. if you're facing white men on the battlefield, there's something scary. There has to they have you have to be scared of that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So like in 1857 in India there was a lot of like the the mutiny or whatever, the rebellion. They a lot of what they were doing was trying to say like we're they're not special, you know. Mm-hmm. There's like a, a thing they said you have the same two hands as your enemy. Um, you know, they're not there's nothing special about these people. If you shoot them, they'll die too, right? Mm-hmm. 